or we'll be going into some details about exactly how end user computing works on AWS, but a lot of it's going to be about like why, right? So over the past decade and a half, cloud has really revolutionized how we manage the servers that our applications are deployed to, right? But we can also gain those same benefits of agility, security, and cost savings by only paying for what you use in your end user compute needs, right? So real quick, because I kind of missed it, my name is William McGee. I'm a solutions architect here at AWS, and I am a user of our end using compute uh, services. Specifically, I'll be talking a lot about um, Amazon Workspaces, which is our desktop offering, right? Um, I, myself, am a virtual employee pre-COVID, right? So I have an Amazon Workspace that I use kind of as a, a bit personal business continuity device in case anything ever happens with my physical laptop. I've got that that I can log in with and continue to work, right? That's just one possible use case for workspaces. We'll be getting into some more, right? Because what it's gonna do is it gives users the ability to um, access your company data from anywhere using any device. They can log in from their personal computers, from their Android phones, um, and still maintain access to all their corporate resources. This is also gonna help IT maintain data security because they're able to centrally manage these workspaces just like they can servers. Right. So these statistics are actually from 2018. Obviously the past year has thrown them kinda all upside down. I'm sure the numbers are much higher right now. Um, and even as they we start to get back into the office and revert to the mean, I would expect some of these numbers to uh, continue to accelerate up. Right. But as of 2018, about 65% of employees thought they'd be more productive if they had more flexible work policies. Things like the ability to work from home remotely from time to time, ability to access corporate information from their own personal devices. Uh, by 2018 already, 43% of workers were working remotely. I'm one of those 43%. And about 16 million people were part of the gig economy. So temps, contractors, and freelancers. The kind of people that you wanna be able to onboard quickly into your environment because they're only gonna be there for short-term contracts. Um, a little more about myself. Prior to being a solutions architect, I worked in our professional services organization, which meant I was a contractor working with customers. And I can tell you from experience, the customers that used our workspaces to onboard me versus those who were still depending on physical laptops, it was the difference between being ready on day one to start helping with the two month contract versus maybe taking up to two weeks sometimes to get a physical laptop actually working and connecting to their infrastructure so that I could start to become productive. Um, and on a two to even six month contract, that lag is gonna impact your deadline, right? So the kind of agility that you're gonna get from moving your end user compute into the cloud can be extremely beneficial. Organizations were already in 2018 starting to investigate, uh, use or investigate cloud desktops at a rate of 67 or 76%, right? And 77% of cloud desktop users felt that those uh, environments were more secure than a physical laptop, right? They didn't have to worry about uh, what if I'm traveling for work and I accidentally leave a laptop in a hotel, right? They didn't have to worry about um, what happens if the device breaks on me. So as I've kind of already started to touch on, some of the things customers are telling they want telling us they want is the ability to use their personal devices to access work data, uh, the ability to better support contract workers, access for access to work data while on the go, you know, tr commuting via trains, planes. Um, they want improved data security because security is always top of mind. And they want to improve their agility. As I said, the ability to get people uh, the resources they need to start being productive right away. And, and people, what's not working for people now is if they're handling physical devices, they have to manage inventory. Uh, if you're trying to allow people to bring their own device and they're accessing things directly with that device, it gets very complicated to make sure that you have a good security posture, that data that's saved on those devices, is something that you can wipe clean if necessary, making sure that things are backed up and able to scale appropriately. It gets hard with physical devices. And companies that were already using like on-premise virtual desktops, they still have upfront investments for that infrastructure. 
right? If they suddenly need more capacity to support the number of people connecting through those VDIs, it could take weeks to deploy that. And then just like um, with any kind of data center server management, there's real effort and cost to maintaining those uh, servers that you don't have to deal with when you move your end user computing to the cloud. So the way workspaces is transforming this space is allowing access from anywhere from any device. I kind of started going through them, but this includes Windows desktops, Linux desktops, Mac OS, Android devices, uh, Chrome desktops, as well as zero clients. It's gonna improve your security because again, you can centrally manage them. It's gonna be able to scale with your workforce. You don't have to have any hardware provisioned ahead of time. You're bringing contractors on quickly for a project that just started gaining a ton of momentum when people hadn't expected it to. No problem. You can just spin up machines for them, right? And as with everything in the cloud, you're going to benefit from a pay-as-you-go model. With workspaces, there are two basic ways to pay for them. You can either pay for a flat monthly fee for an always-on device, or you can pay a much smaller monthly fee along with a per hour charge for an on-demand device. Right? And we'll get into a little more about when you'd wanna use one versus the other. But the broad idea is if uh, someone's going to be using this as their primary device, you wanna get an always on. If they're going to maybe be like me where it's more of a business continuity or an occasional access from home, then you might be better off with that uh, on-demand cost model. So some ways that you can use workspaces, right? By having these virtual desktops, it makes it much easier to support a global workforce, right? Think about how tough it is to hire today. By supporting a global workforce, it opens up um, the possibilities of who you have access to as far as human resources are, right? It enables a BYOD as well as just remote work for not necessarily a full-time global employee, but maybe somebody who's about an hour and a half from the office and you're able to improve their work-life harmony by allowing them to work remotely once or twice a week. As I've mentioned before, this is great for project-based work. You know, on a normal employee lifespan, if you're thinking they're gonna be here around five years, plus or minus, it doesn't matter if it took two weeks to get that desktop to them up and running. But when you're looking at two to six month projects, the ability to have something provisioned instantly is hugely beneficial. Right. And as I mentioned before, security and compliance is of utmost importance. Um, we'll cover some of the regulations that this is designed to meet out of the box, but HIPAA, GDPR, and PCI are a few regulatory requirements that Workspaces does meet for you. high level the security improvements, you're not gonna have any sensitive work data on those personal devices. You can enable BYOD, but since you're only accessing the data through the workspace, you don't have to worry about you know, somebody who maybe didn't put a really good password on their phone saving something that is gonna be sensitive information for your company. Workspaces allows you to enforce encryption at rest for all the data that's saved on them. And when you connect to that workspace, that stream is encrypted as well in transit. Workspaces also plays well with many existing tools that you likely have in place, right? The workspaces will be deployed to a VPC and that VPC can be um, peered with your intranet surfaces so that you're able to access any files or data that's available on the internet through them. You're gonna be able to connect the workspaces to an existing Microsoft Active Directory node or stand up a new one if you're creating workspaces for kind of an isolated use. But you could either set up uh, the Microsoft Active Directory node um, as kind of a, a tr with a trust for your on-premise Active Directory, or we also offer a proxy service that's just like a pass-through proxy so that the people logging on to their workspaces will just use their already existing corporate credentials. We also support multi-factor authentication using RADIUS servers. We support SCCM for the configuration of this workspaces as well as global policies. And uh, we'll touch on a little bit if you have various application management that you needs. There's also a workspace application management service um, if you don't already have something in place that you'd wanna use. And, and the idea behind that is your image 
and the kind of security pushes that you're going to uh, enforce at the image level for your workspaces has a different life cycle than some of applications like, um, I don't know, I'm, I'm a dev, so my mind keeps going to like Visual Studio Code, right? That upgrade cycle, the installation cycle for that um, is gonna be very different than it is for the OS itself. And then lastly, uh, we also support certificate authority for setting up trusted clients. Right? What this means is you can add another layer of security by setting up the workspaces to only allow connection from clients who have installed a certificate that's specified when you configure the workspace. That way you can't have a stranger trying to connect to your workspace. That connection will get rejected by the service. Right. So real quick, I want to talk about Amazon WorkDocs. This is a secure, fully managed file storage service that comes with an SDK. And the reason it's important is because just like with your servers, you want to decouple your compute from your storage. You want to do the same with workspaces. Right? You, in theory, the life cycle of a workspace is something that you could destroy and rebuild. Let's say um, you're pushing out a really important security update and for some reason on 10% of devices, it's just not working correctly. You want to be able to create a new image with that security update already in it and replace the existing workspaces with that one based on the new image with that security update without having to you know, worry that um, we're gonna blow away all the user's information. So WorkDocs integrates with workspaces to provide external storage. Um, now, it is not a workspaces only service. I use WorkDocs with my physical laptop, but the benefits of using it with workspaces is first, you get 50 free gigs of storage um, for the workspace users that can be upgraded to one terabyte for $2 a month. But also, when you're configuring this, if you're going through the AWS console, integrating these two services is as simple as checking a box, right? So they, they just work really well together. I'm gonna take a moment and kind of go through a list of some of the uh, features that Workspaces supports. Um, as we mentioned, supports a ton of clients, including Zero Client, Chromebook, and various Android laptops, I'm sorry, Android phones. It supports printing to local devices through that workspace, as well as having audio input through the workspace so that you connect to like Skype or WebEx calls that were initiated in the workspace itself. As for management, the kind of IT concerns, you can create custom images. So when you go to set them up, initially you're going to select a pre-configured image that'll be you know, Windows 10, Windows 7, or some Linux version if you want to use Linux desktops, right? But let's say, everybody in your organization is a developer like me and you want Visual Studio Code to be part of that custom image that gets spun up, right? You could first create a workspace, log in, install whatever applications you want to be included with your base image, including security updates and um, virus scanning software, shut it down, then you're able to create a custom image from that machine very similar to the way that the AMIs are created for servers. And then you can use that image as the base for your deployment. As I mentioned before, also supports an application manager because I use Visual Studio Code as an example for the custom image, but it probably is living in a different life cycle. So you're gonna want like an application manager that can reach out to those workspaces and keep those various apps up to date. And last, it has API support. I mentioned how the cloud revolutionized the server space because of the kind of agility it provided, the cost savings and security. Um, but I think a lot of us realize that a large part of this revolution has been because now your infrastructure is driven through API calls, right? This is how you have your infrastructure's code. This is how you get things like CloudFormation and, and AWS CDK. Workspaces is also uh, driven through APIs, which means that it makes it very easy to customize a solution to your needs. But it also means that there are a couple of really interesting out-of-the-box solutions that you can install into your AWS environment that aren't an integrated part of the service. And we'll go through uh, two of those that I found very interesting, just as kind of, um, A, they're potentially directly useful, but they're also very inspirational about the kind of customization you can do when you have an API-driven service like this. And then for monitoring, you're gonna have some very familiar tools if you've been using AWS. 
uh, it supports CloudWatch and CloudTrail. As far as like performance and cost, there are several different bundle options. You're going to be able to pick about how much memory you want and whether or not you want a, a GPU included. Um, most instances aren't, aren't going to need that, but if you have maybe engineers using the workspaces in order to create CAD diagrams, they, they may want that GPU support. We also support bring your own license. Now there's some caveats to this um, because we need to make sure that when you do use BYOL that you're meeting the license requirements set forth by Microsoft. So if that's something you're interested in, you're going to want to reach out to, um, if you're working with an account manager, an account manager, or if not, just open a support ticket to make sure that you qualify for BYOL, and if not, what you might need to do. Right. As I mentioned with security, we have, you know, encryption at rest, multi-factor authentication, the ability to use certificate-based device authorization. And we also support several certifications such as SOC 1, 2, HIPAA, PCI, GDPR. Right. So as I promised, I want to highlight two different workspace optimizations that are enabled by that API-driven nature of the service. The first one is a self-service portal. If you search for Amazon Workspace's self-service portal, you'll see the link below. And what this is, is a solution that you can deploy into your account that will set up a web app that your users could go to, put in their corporate information, and request a workspace that would be automatically generated without any manual intervention required. Right. Now, this is fully customizable, so if that sounds too powerful to you, you can look at the application and try to you know, add controls for, well, maybe only managers can do this. Maybe you don't want them to be able to select the bundle. You want to have a specific uh, bundle in mind due to cost constraints that is the only one that will automatically be deployed. Or you can enable a very similar service using uh, tools like our service catalog or ServiceNow, which if you're not familiar, support an ITIL workflow that makes it easy to specify who has access to the ability to request this. Um, and then the main benefit for all of these is that you can now request this workspace. A, a typical user with minimal IT knowledge can request this workspace with zero uh, manual uh, with any with zero manual effort required. Right. Great case study of this is Grubhub went from just having a handful of workspaces to over 1,200 in two days because they created a solution based on our APIs that let people request workspaces through AWS Service Catalog. Another great API-driven optimization is the cost optimizer. Again, if you search for Amazon Workspace Cost Optimizer, you'll find the link below. And what this is is a CloudFormation template that you can deploy into your account. And what it's going to do is try to figure out whether or not that on-demand cost model or always-on model is going to save you the most money. Right? Because like I said before, if somebody's only using it occasionally, then on-demand is going to be the cheapest solution. But if it is someone's main device, then always-on is actually going to be less expensive and you aren't necessarily going to know ahead of time exactly how these devices are going to be used. And they may not be the same for every single person. So what this does is it looks at all of the CloudWatch statistics that are being generated by Workspace and uses that to determine uh, which ones would be cheaper run on demand versus always on and makes API calls out to change that running mode to save you money. Using Workspaces, and this cost optimization, our customer, Kiowa Kirin, which is a pharmaceutical and biotechnical company in Japan, was able to reduce the cost of their reduced costs by 30% over their self hosted VDI solution that they had prior to moving their end user compute into the cloud. And of course, would AWS presentation would be complete without showing just how many customers have been using the service really? No matter how you operate, you should evaluate moving some of your end user compute needs into the cloud. Thank you. Again, my name is William McGee. If you have questions, you can reach out to me.